Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to New Covenant Grace Fellowship on this wonderful, bright, I don't know if it's sunny, it's, it's, got, it's not raining, put it that way. It's a beautiful day here in Inverness, Florida, and we are rejoicing in the resurrection of our Savior. And so this morning, our message, I was telling the group here that my husband, it was his thought that was behind the title of this message. So it is, was the resurrection necessary? Think about that. Was the resurrection really necessary? So we're going to take a few minutes and look at resurrection. Resurrection is what, guys? Who knows what, children? What's resurrection? Rizzo. Somebody dies and they come back to life. That's right. You have to die first, don't you? You have to be dead. No life in you. And then all of a sudden you come alive again, right? Does that happen all the time? No. no. Have you ever known anyone that died and came back to life? I mean dead like for a long time? Yeah? Jesus did. Yes, indeed. All right. Jesus modeled resurrection power because, you know, to raise someone from the dead, for someone to come back, there has to be a lot of power coming to that person to restart the brain, the heart, all the organs, the blood flow, the oxygen, everything that's necessary to sustain life. So there's got to be a tremendous power source available for that event to take place. Now, just as Rizzo said, Jesus was one who also not only received resurrection in his body, but he brought resurrection power to others. Can any of you kids tell me someone that Jesus raised from the dead and no prompting from dad? I mean, you know, come on. Hey, it was an accident. Well, you know. Uh, who was it? Who was it that Jesus spoke life to. He said, you know, there's no hope for your children, you know. <laughs> Tyler, did you know? Okay, now we'll have to go to an adult. Yes. Lazarus. Remember the story of Lazarus? You know? Now, Lazarus was dead for how many days? How many days, kids? Three days. That's right. Three days. Lazarus was dead for three days, and Jesus went to him. And he knew before he went that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, wasn't he? All right? That there is a power source that Jesus had that he was going to use to bring life to Lazarus. So now we have Jesus. Jesus has died. We know we just had Good Friday, and, and Jesus indeed died. He died on that cross for us all. And when, when you die, what happens to you? The Bible says that in death, if you are absent from your body, that means your spirit man, if your spirit, because when you die, let me ask this, I'll back up. When you die, when Jesus died and was lying in that tomb, was, was his spirit still inside of him? Was he just like laying in, in that tomb, just waiting and saying, well, I've got to stay here for three days, and then, then I'm going to make, make my big escape. So did he do that? No. No. So the Bible says, the Bible says that when you die, your spirit man, and we've talked about that's the real you. The person that, that is really you is your spirit, and your spirit will live forever. And the Bible says that when you die, your spirit then leaves this shell, the body, the shell of a body, and it goes to be with the Lord. So when Jesus died, his spirit, what does his spirit do? His spirit went to God, went to heaven, and what did he do there? What did Jesus in his spirit do when he got to heaven? This is a real brain teaser, isn't it? Good thing it's not school. Yes, Aiden. Well, when Jesus went to heaven after he had died, he took his blood with him and he poured it over the mercy seat. He poured it over the altar of God. And by doing that, he now made it possible for all of humanity to have a relationship with Almighty God again. 
that all the things that are called sin under the law, all the bad things and the mistakes that we continue to make even now in our time and generation, it doesn't matter anymore. God doesn't look at all the mistakes. He doesn't look at all the shortcomings. He doesn't look any longer at even the sin of the old covenant. Because the blood of Jesus satisfied the Father's desire for judgment against that. And that brought restoration in relationship. See, Almighty God was Almighty God back in the Old Testament. But now when Jesus said, it is finished, it issued in a whole new paradigm shift. And now, instead of just being Almighty God, I mean, he is Almighty God. But now he is our Abba Father. And if you have a father, you are talking relationship. Jesus was a son, God's only begotten son. And so that talks more of relationship. So here we have Jesus then. His spirit was in heaven, poured blood out over the, the altar. And he also, he also did something else in the spirit. He went to hell. And you know what? He didn't go down to hell to get punished and beat up and tortured and, and have all these terrible things. The devil was not beaten on him in hell when he went down there. Jesus, just for clarity's sake, Jesus went to hell to bring the, victor the victory that he won with his sacrifice down to the devil. And he said he took the enemies, all of the principalities, all of the powers of the darkness were now under his subjection. He was the conquering king. So Jesus went to hell as the conquering king, not as someone that is going to get beat up and stomped on because he happened to have all the sins of the world that he died with that day. Do you understand? That's important to know. Jesus didn't go there because he had to, because the devil owned him. Jesus went down to hell to say, I am the victor over you. There is no power, there is no demon, there is no spirit that can attack you in your life in any shape, in any form, at any time, because Jesus conquered them all forever. They are defeated. And that is an important point to always remember because the enemy will come against you. You know, you're going to have fear. You're going to have hopelessness. You're going to have maybe a spirit of suicide. A lot of people deal with this stuff, the hopelessness of life. And when you realize that this thing is coming at you, then what do you do? You remember to say, you know, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm a child of God. And my Jesus has brought the victory to me and you have no power over my life. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to buy into this nonsense because who lives in us? Christ. Christ lives in us. So let's get back to our story here. So here is Jesus' body lying in the tomb, okay? Who knows what a tomb is? Rizzo, what's a tomb? Yeah. A coffin. We call that a coffin. That'd be kind of like a tomb. The tomb that when Jesus was when we're having a little problems with that. When Jesus was was buried back in in um, Israel, they didn't do tombs. Or I'm sorry, they didn't do coffins. A tomb was what? Anybody else know? It was like a cave, wasn't it? Yep. They they dug out this cave and it had stone. And they put a big boulder in front of it. That's right. And that's, so his body was in there. And his body was in there for three days. And Romans 8 says, gives us a clue. How did Jesus come back alive again? I mean, he had power to bring life, didn't he? When he was in this world. But now he was dead. His body was dead. So who was going to speak life to Jesus? Was there a prophet? Did one of the apostles, did the, one of the disciples come and say, Jesus, come forth, just like Jesus did? Joshua. God, wow, you're a smart young man. That is correct. Good job. Joshua said God did. That's exactly right, because in Romans chapter 8, 11, there's a verse of Scripture, and we're not going to turn there, but I'm going to quote it because I love King James. 
It says, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, and I'm just going to do that little phrase. That's why I didn't want to pull it up. We're not looking at the whole verse. We're going to come back and look at that whole verse in a little bit. But that same, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, a spirit raised Christ from the dead. Okay, it wasn't man. Someone didn't, you know, keep Jesus alive and just pretend that he died. He died, and there was a spirit that brought him life again. So where did this powerful spirit come from? Colossians 2. We will look at Colossians 2. If I can... Get my Colossians 2 and verse 9. It says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So in Christ lives all the fullness of God. What is all the fullness of God? What is all the fullness of God meeting to you? Remember, we've talked about the Godhead. We talked about that there is one God. We have three persons in the Godhead, right? We, have, we, 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 we worship a triune God, not three gods. It's one God, but three persons. They're not things. They are persons. So there's the person of God the Father. There's the person of God the Son. There's the person of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had the fullness of God in his human body. So who did he have? He had the Father. Jesus talked about him and the Father are one. I taught my I do I say and do what my Father is telling me to say and do, Jesus would say. So who was that other part of the Godhead that was in Jesus then that day? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very powerful. You know, back when I was a young child in, in the, the particular church that I went to school, they had a parochial school, and, and we were taught that, well, the Holy Spirit is just part of God, but not too important. You know, he had, the Holy Spirit did things way back in the Bible, way, way back in the early days with, on Pentecost, you know, and there were powerful things, but those people needed it, and the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything anymore. And so I kind of grew up thinking, well, the Holy Spirit was just kind of like, you know, the great grandma that is just kind of there in the rocking chair, you know, part of the family, but just kind of quiet, not really doing much. And that is so wrong because it is that Holy Spirit. It is this spirit that was dwelling in Christ. So what happened on that day was after Jesus went to hell, after he had been to heaven, now it was time, three days later, now the spirit that had left and gone to these places now came back into his body, all right? It wasn't the Holy Spirit standing outside the tomb saying, Jesus, come forth. It was, it was the spirit inside of Jesus, the man, okay? Inside of Jesus, the man was now the fullness of the Godhead had, had re-entered him, in all the fullness thereof, okay? And that power source is what began to bring life again to Jesus. And it quickened his body. It quickened his mortal body for him to come alive and to be restored completely. So now, let's look at Romans chapter 8, 11. And we will quote it properly. All right, <clears throat> Romans 8, chapter 11. Boy, my voice, just a second. <clears throat> Boy, my voice is just really croaky this morning. Uh, <clears throat> verse 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. King James says, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So it's, it's, it's if, that's a prepositional phrase. It says, if that same spirit, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. So if that power source that was so prominently expressed in Jesus' life that day, enough to bring him back to life again. If that same spirit dwells in you, what's going to happen? 
It says, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Wow. Do you understand what I've just said here? The Holy Spirit is so powerful that even though Jesus was dead for three days, when the spirit came back into his body, there was that power source that energized his physical body once again and restored it completely. He did not have a weak heart. He didn't have weak lungs. He didn't have an partial brain working. Jesus was complete. And the Bible says if that same spirit that raised Christ is living in you, guess what? There will come a day when he will quicken your earthly body as well. And we call that the final resurrection at the return of Christ, right? So these bodies are going to, and you know what? The, the question is lots of times too, what happens to people who drown or get eaten by sharks or blown up in war or, you know, die in fires? And what happens? There's nothing left of their bodies. People who are cremated, you know? What happens to their bodies? And um, nothing, nothing happens. Excuse me. Yes, Joshua. What? That's right. You go to heaven. You do. These body parts will all come back and take form once again. There is not one person's body part that is lost, even though it might have been blown to kingdom come or eaten and digested or whatever happened to it that body will come back together again because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is that powerful. The Holy Spirit brings life and energizes us. So it takes great, great, great power to do this. And Jesus declared something to his disciples one day. Let's look at Acts 1 and 8 because we're looking... at the Holy Spirit... And why is the Holy Spirit so important to us? Acts 1 and 8 says, and Jesus was was speaking to, to the disciples, and he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, up until this point, the Holy Spirit was not indwelling the heart of mankind. Because why? Under the old covenant, that couldn't happen. There was not the relationship. It, the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophets, the, the, some of the kings and things, and, but there wasn't any indwelling. But after Calvary, that all changed, and now Jesus is saying, you are going to receive power in your life because the fullness of the Godhead is going to be coming to you. So do we need this impartation? <laughs> Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He said, you will receive power. Do we, re- do we need to receive power? That's a trick question. Most people would say, yes, I need to receive power. And the reality is, go over to Colossians 2. Let's go back to Colossians 2 again. The reality of this whole thing is, Wait for it. We will have the answer. (coughs) Colossians 2.10 says, So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So now, let's back up to verse 9. Let's just read this. You know, it's so important to read Scripture in context. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Remember, we talked about that. The fullness of God is in Christ's body. And so we, we decided that, wow, he's got all this power. He's got all of God in him. He's got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Godhead. And so you also are complete. You are complete. And like my husband always says, can you become more completer, which is not a word? Can you become more complete? If you are complete, if you have completed your tax forms, and I hope you all have, 
Can they get even more complete if you filled in every line, every blank, you, 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 you just did it all, you got all the proper identification? If it's all there, is there anything left that needs to get done? Of course not. It's complete. The form is complete. And so the Bible is saying, so also we are complete. How do we, come, how do we become complete? Through our union with Christ, because of Christ. If we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we have what? The fullness of the Godhead dwelling within us. So when Jesus said to the apostles, the disciples, they weren't apostles yet, he said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you because the disciples were under the law, right? They lived with Jesus under the law. And up until that place, they did not have the indwelling presence. But now Calvary has happened. Resurrection Sunday has come. And now Jesus is saying, guys, wait here for a while because the Holy Spirit, now you will become complete. And because we live on the other side of Calvary, don't we? We're not standing here at the cross. We're not standing in the law. We stand in grace. It's been done. The work has been done. Jesus says it is finished. There's nothing left. It is complete. Our salvation is complete. And in that, in his victory that Jesus accomplished that day, just as he was complete, so now Colossians says, we also are complete. We have the Father in us, because we call him Abba, Father. We have Christ, the Messiah, our, our kinsman, redeemer in us. And we also have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling with us as well. So, we are not under the law. And after the resurrection, the fullness of God was now available to everyone. And so it began now with all of those who put their faith and trust in Christ that followed him prior to Calvary. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read um, 1 through 4. So, so now we're moving, away from, we're moving away from Resurrection Sunday. Now we're here at the days of Pentecost. Forty days have gone by. And these guys are waiting and waiting. You know, sometimes God just says, wait. Wait. Be patient and wait. So on the day of Pentecost, all the believers... Now, there weren't any doubters in that room. These were followers. These were the believers of Christ. These are those that truly said that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He was the one that was foretold thousands of years before in all the writings of the Old Covenant. It was Jesus. So all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. The presence of God came into that building powerfully. Has, has anyone ever heard a tornado? A rushing mighty wind is like a tornado. Have you ever heard one? I've heard two in my lifetime. Up in, up in Michigan, we, we receive quite a few tornadoes. They're not as big as the big Oklahoma and Texas. Boy, those folks, they get, they get big ones out there. Um, but the ones that, that I heard, it sounds exactly like, they say it sounds like a, like a freight train. And that's exactly it. There's this rumbling, huge noise. And it, it's very alarming to hear it. It's like, oh my goodness, this is, this is bad. This is bad news. And it's going to be big trouble. So why do you think the Holy Spirit came into this room with such an entrance? Exactly it. I believe the Holy Spirit wanted to leave absolutely no doubt in the minds of those people, those 120 that were gathered there that day, that God has just entered the building. It was God, and it is God Almighty. And there's a whole lot of power behind this God Almighty. You know, 
it was like the tornado was in the house with you, and there was, it was, um, then what it looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So God wanted to get their attention, and he did it. He demonstrated just the magnitude, and that was just a, a fraction of his real power. That wasn't the full extent of God. If he would have come in his full presence, he would have blown the place apart. But he wanted them to realize what was now in them. The Holy Spirit came into them. So he's saying, if this amazed you, it's coming into you. It's coming into your life, into your life. And guess what you're going to do when I'm working in you and through you? You're going to be a house on fire. You're going to be like a tornado that just rolled through the town. You're going to be a voice that will not be quieted. You're going to be a demonstrator of the love and the power of God because it is not in your own natural ability to do so. But when the Holy Spirit is starting to move you and he will move on you, that you will just step into just a dimension of God that will amaze yourself as well as everybody that stands around you they'll say wow I didn't know that was in there and you'll say wow God I didn't know I didn't know we've got a power source it was a power source and my question is now was it just for the 12 I mean not the 12 but the 120 were they the I mean they're the only ones that got it that day so what about the rest what about the rest of the folks switch over to Acts 19 and we're just about done. Acts 19. Now this is down the road a ways. First seven verses. And this is Paul. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Okay? Paul found some believers. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So these guys were so far removed that, you know, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have radio or TV, so news traveled slowly. They weren't aware of Pentecost. They didn't know that it happened. They were believers of Christ. You know, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and I'm sure they were sharing with others how come they believed that. And who knows, they might have even formed house meetings or whatever at that time. And so they said, no, we didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. <clears throat> and they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So this was something that just kept going on. So those that had received this impartation of the Holy Spirit, they were finding those that were living under the old covenant, the old law, you know, but in the old law, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they didn't know about the Holy Spirit. And so Paul then would go up and lay hands upon them and give what was in him to those that he was, to those believers. The Holy Spirit then came upon them. So my question is, we as believers have come under that teaching. I was under it for years. In fact, a few weeks ago, I said, I remember when I became spirit-filled. You know what? That was a wrong statement for me to have made, knowing this. It says, in Christ, we received it all. We are complete, it says. We are complete. You, I'm not lacking anything. You don't get a little bit of the Holy Ghost, and now you need an infilling. He doesn't drain out as you use him. You know, he, he's, he is there. He is there forever. And so we do not need another baptism into the Holy Spirit. 
These people did because they didn't know there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit had, was not poured out upon all mankind at that place, at that point. These were people that were from the old law era. Everyone from that point that was no longer old law, and this side of Calvary, when they accepted Christ, guess what? They got everything. They got everything. And so we don't have to go around asking people, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? You know? You don't have to ask them anymore. Yes, we received the Holy Ghost when we believed. And it's a powerful Holy Ghost. We are complete. You are complete in Christ. So let's go back to the question of this message. Was the resurrection necessary? Was it necessary? Go to 1 Corinthians in our closing. First Corinthians 15. Whoops. Flew on by. Okay. The heading is talking about the resurrection of the dead. And this is Paul. But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection from the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith, your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. You know, some people believe that once you die, you, you get put in the ground and that's the end of you. That there is no spirit, there is no heaven, there is no hell. You're just dead in the ground and you just kind of decay and rot away. And so that, that belief system was in place back here. The Sadducees, they were sad, you see, yes. because... They'd, I made a joke. Yay. Well, a little one. Yeah. Well executed. Well execu I thought so, yes. They didn't believe in the resurrection. You know? They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so he, Paul is saying, well, gosh, you know, you're making us out to be liars because we said God raised him from the dead. And everyone that has put faith in Christ is kind of pointless. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. That's a heavy deal. You know, if Christ had not risen from the dead that day, that third day, the problem with sin would still remain in our lives. We would not have a relationship, in other words. We would not have a relationship with God Almighty. He would not be your Abba Father. He would be your judge. And you'd have to do animal sacrifice to cover the sin, the wrong doings of your life. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. What good news. So that resurrection was so necessary on so many levels, primarily to bring us into relationship with God Almighty. We are complete. And all the blessings that were given to Jesus, it says, we have all that blessing, all the, all the goodness. And it's not, it's not stored up for us just in heaven. So many believe that we endure life here on earth because one day we'll go to heaven and we'll have all the, the treasures and the blessings and all the rewards for us in heaven. And there'll be plenty of them there. But Jesus died to give us life here on earth. It's here on earth where he wants us to have our joy. He wants us to have our peace. He wants us to have all the goodness, the favor, the blessings, the abundance 
the abundance of life flowing through us because that is our testimony to everyone around us. They'll say, well, gosh, gosh, you are going through such a hard time right now. I see the situation in your family, but yet you, you're smiling, you are rejoicing, you have peace. Where do you get that peace? So many in the world today are going through such hard places. Our, our, our world is in an uproar, and people are afraid, and they don't have peace. And Jesus, because he rose from the dead, and the fullness of the Godhead dwells in us, we have the peace that goes beyond the understanding of the world. It goes beyond our understanding. God keeps us and directs us. And so we are a blessed people because of the resurrection, both here and now in this life, and, in, and certainly because Jesus, his body came alive, our bodies one day will be reunited with our spirit, and they'll be all fixed up. So all the, all the issues we have with our bodies here will not have the issue up there. Isn't that good news? Yeah, yeah, can't wait, can't wait. So this is a good day, a day of rejoicing. Thank goodness Jesus rose from the dead. He loves us so much that he was willing to embrace all that suffering because now we are joint heirs in the family of God. So go in peace today. Go in knowing that you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You have the powerhouse of God in you. And that's you kids. You know, I said before, there is no junior Holy Spirit if you, if you have believed that Jesus loved you and died for you, kids, guess what? You have the Holy Ghost power in you. You have it. You can do awesome things for God in it. So go and be a blessing wherever God has put you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week. 